Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first My Macula and Me webinar of 2023. I'm uh, Cathy Elf, I'm the Chief Executive of the Macula Society, and it is a very great pleasure indeed uh, to see so many people online with us this evening. We've got more than 150 people joining us tonight uh, already this evening, maybe may, may more people coming in um, as we speak. So it's lovely to have you all here. Thank you very, very much indeed. Now, we have a great series of talks uh, being lined up for you for 2023. Um, uh, and uh, tonight's, the first one of the year, is very, very special. So I'm going to get on with it straight away and tell you that about five years ago, the Macular Society formed a collaboration with some other sight loss charities, Blind Veterans UK, um, uh, Sight Scott and Sight Scotland Veterans, um, to form a special research arm, which we call Action Against AMD, or um, Triple AMD for short. Now, the job of AAAMD is to find a way to stop early macular degeneration, develop into late stage macular degeneration. And by that, we mean the stage at which it, the disease starts to take people's sight. So the point at which sight, sight loss starts to, starts to happen. Now, this is no easy task, is it, of course, to find a brand new therapeutic for uh, something as complicated uh, and complex a disease as uh, age-related macular degeneration. But actually, that's just the start of it. Um, the very fact that macular degeneration can take so long to develop, many years, 5, 10, 15 years, we don't really know how long, means that even if we could find, and when we do find, a new therapy that would treat early stage AMD, it would be very difficult to get it into proper clinical trials because it would take too long to test the drug. And so you'll know that there is a great deal of interest in health data. And by that, we mean the, the health information that we all as individual human beings carry around with us. So our medical histories, our unique medical histories, and also our unique genes, our unique genome. And all this health data is in fact now being seen as the key to our future health. That is true in AMD as much as it is in any other disease area. And so AAAMD's key strategy, or one of the key strategic aims, is to be able to use health data to unlock uh, the ways to stop macular degeneration progressing from the earliest stages before anybody notices to the really devastating cases where people start to lose their sight and eventually, sadly, still all their central vision. Now, the Chief Executive Officer, uh, and Chief Scientist of AAAMD is Dr. Wen Hua Li. We call him Li, and he is here with us tonight just exactly to explain what the AAA plan is. Li, uh, Happy New Year to you, and uh, welcome to My Macula and Me. I'm going to hand over to you straight away. Please tell us about the um, health data plans embedded in the key strategic aims of AAAMD. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's a pleasure always to speak to your listeners and, and the members of Macular Society. Um, so before I start, I'd just like to put a caveat here, just to say that I will use this opportunity to take it very leisurely. We will be having a conversation, hopefully. I will try to um, speak in as little technical concept as possible. And we'll try to walk you through the basic concept so we can build up to what is what we're trying to do. Uh, with that in mind, I will start sharing. Uh, so, but let, let me get started then. So the, the topic of the talk is how could artificial intelligence transform eye care? And thank you, Kathy, for the intro. Uh, and I'd like just to share with you, of course, we all know there is not a day that passes before we hear yet another story about how artificial intelligence actually let's shorten it for AI, has the potential to solve the most diverse set of tasks, some of them mundane, others at the bleeding edge of the human endeavors. Now, advances in AI are not restricted to just, as we know nowadays, we hear around in media, self-driving cars, production lines, e-commerce recommendations. But one of its most promising applications is it is truly in healthcare and we are very proud to say that the ophthalmology is at the forefront of this revolution. But then, um, first thing first, first things first, yeah? Let me just try to see, let's try just defining what really artificial intelligence is, because I, it is very common that simple words, two simple words, 
in many people's mind are framed differently. But for the purpose of this talk, and in fact, for a lot of the uh, way that we operate in the research uh, community, artificial intelligence is simply any technique which enables computers to mimic human behavior. Yeah. So having said that, ah, we have people raising raising hands. Uh, just a quick listen. Do anybody is that any problem with the? Uh, so somebody has um, asked a question. Does everybody have sound? I certainly yeah. have sound. I think Felicity has sound. Um, if anybody is having problem with their sound, perhaps you could refresh your browser or, or maybe log out and log back in again. But I, I, I don't think the system is not working. Um, we're not getting lots of um, calls. So if your okay. system is causing a problem, perhaps you could log out and log back in again. Thanks. Right. So thank you, Cathy. I'll just continue here. And then if this is artificial intelligence, it is very... Um, just to illustrate that this sometimes can be misleading, uh, thank you, Patricia, um, is this very early uh, print of what was called a mechanical Turk. So this was actually almost a toy that presented some form of automaton. So it's like, it looks almost like a robot, which is not human, that could play chess really well against anybody who challenges it. But in reality, this was uh, a trick. It did mimic human interaction, but actually there was a human inside the box playing the chess. Having said that, let's think about then what it is the real, almost the, 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 the use or what we are looking now into the modern day interpretation or acceptance of AI, which is definitely something that can mimic human uh, behavior. But then, although we have been fed of dreams of AI, or however it's used, been used to be called in the past, as a solution for all the things that we don't like doing. So for instance, something um, of a more menial task um, to even complex decisions such as playing chess, it is very fair to say that let's take the first thing out of the equation. The fear of machine taking away jobs, especially in the field of ophthalmology, optometries, where you really need that human interaction is still very far from happening. Yes. So where we see that kind of replacement are for things that are perhaps a little bit more repetitive that can that the computers and robots, etc., can do with a high efficiency without needing a proper human interaction. Now, having that in mind, if anything, what AI can do is really to free the pre precious time and talent of highly trained professionals, health professionals, to, del to deliver even better care, which will always require this human to human interaction. Uh, and of course, that, that reminds me always of the movie, uh, Chaplin's movie about turning different knobs and then making things in a production line. But then, what is AI? Now, despite the fancy term, AI is basically maths and statistics applied in a clever way to assess our information, connections, and correlations from a vast amount of data. This data is then used to train algorithms, and then, you know, sorry about throwing this uh, uh, very, well, the buzzwords, right? Algorithms, data, etc. But algorithms are nothing more than a process or set of rules to conduct a function. So perhaps uh, this is a good space, a good time to, to pause for us to look into, you know, what does entail all this different kind of uh, uh, terms that we're telling you about. Well, information, data, etc., that goes through a recipe or algorithm can produce an answer. The easiest way for you to visualize this um, is thinking about a recipe, right? So if you have your information, your ingredients, with the right recipe, you can get a meal. Yes, we all agree that? Like that's very, very simple. So when, we, when people, when data scientists, for instance, uh, when they talk about algorithms or models, they're basically talking about recipe. Recipe for what? 
for prediction, for an outcome. So in terms of AI methods, what we normally have is this central piece missing. We know, for instance, that this is the outcome we want. So for instance, a burger here, and then we give the machine the ingredients and have the machine to try to deduce what are the different ways we can combine these things to reach this meal. So this is what a recipe, an algorithm would do. Now, of course, the recipe and the algorithm, which comes through the machine learning, uh, will differ depending on the end task you're telling it to do. So for instance, let's say that we are looking at input of information data, which could be eye scans, which could be genetics, whatever. But what we really are interested is AMD. So we can train the computer to try to figure out how these different features are leading perhaps to diagnosis of a condition. But of course, if we change the, the kind of disease we're looking after, let's say macular hole, we're still looking at the same data. And then the recipe, the algorithm to diagnose this certain condition will also be slightly different. Yes, but the interesting thing here is that what we've seen here uh, uh, in this, sorry, I should have changed this slide to, to lasagna as well, which is from the same set of information, depending on what you are training your machine to look for, you will have a different recipe, a different algorithm. And so this is actually the kind of the framework of what we talk about data, algorithm or model and results, which could be a diagnostic tool, for instance. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Now, just as search engines have democratized instant access to knowledge. So when we are in a pub quiz, for instance, uh, we can just simply Google and the information comes in really quickly. That actually elevated us to almost a quiz genius status. So AI derived algorithms trained on a large set of atomic images, for instance, fundus and OCT scans, and I will come to that later on, can be mathematically uh, narrowed down through computer and mathematical models on subtle nuances, differences, and patterns and features that we can use to identify certain diseases, right? So we can train the machine to know whether from one image that is presented, what this image is telling us with regards to perhaps diagnostics, which is one condition and another, which is early or late, yeah? So in this sense, what the AI and the machine ingesting a lot of data is not that different from where early career professionals are seeking advice from more senior colleagues, right? When we talk about those senior colleagues, they are much better at identifying or making that diagnosis because they've seen way more cases that they experience. And of course, each expert have developed their own way of classifying and identifying each specific case. So if we take the AI or computer science parlance, each of these senior optometrists or ophthalmologists, they have developed their own method, their own algorithm. So Professor X is so much better identifying AMD because he has been trained with a lot of input, a lot of data he's seen throughout his lifetime, right? From the cases they have seen. If we can feed that information into a computer system, which can then synthesize or try to come up with ways to understand or classify those diseases, then that would be a um, use of algorithms that can help the expert to detect especially diseases which are harder to diagnose, right? Corner cases, you're not sure one thing or another. I'll give you an example. So when we are the early days when people were trained in computers to look at images, right? So for instance, when you go to Facebook or Google Photos, how does it know that Lee, myself, somebody takes my picture, uh, is labeled as Lee on another picture where there's no information about my own uh, identity. 
That is because a lot of people from friends start tagging it. What does that tagging does? That is actually training the system to start and identify that variations in these different entries, they all telling you that is one same entity. It's a cat in this case. But what happens if we are training a system only with a limited set of pictures, in this case nine, and we all say this is a cat, how do we expect the system to really come up with a correct identification when we show them the machine, for instance, a picture of a lion, for instance? For some people, that is a cat. For others, it's not. So therefore, it is important that when we are looking into AI training, that we are not only providing them with lots of data without information, that we actually do add annotation. So this is actually uh, um, labeling those cases. Okay. Now, today there have been several very exciting proof of concept where images from your retina, from retina, have been used to train algorithms to detect and diagnose several conditions, including ophthalmic and ophthalmic uh, uh, diseases. Um, before I go into the, uh, so I'm moving out now from the general concepts. So we are framing now certain terms to help us understand how this can be helpful. And then moving into more about ophthalmology, optometry. So in here, I'm sharing with you the cross cut of how an eye looks like. So the eye is an amazing organ which captures light from the environment and it works with the brain to create vision. Now the part of the eye which can sense light is called the retina and that lines the inside of your eyeball. Think about a sphere and that lines the in inner side of your eyeball. And the macula is actually a specialized section of macula responsible for your central high definition color vision. And it's a tiny disc of about five millimeter in diameter. Um, and here is actually how the retina and the macula will look like if you look face on. So we have the eye. If you put a camera straight down your eyeball through the transparent part of the eyes and look inside, that's what you can see. Yeah, it is this picture of the back of the retina where all the different cells that can sense light are sitting. Now, this is the funders, uh, photo of an uh, AMD patient in the earlier stage of disease. Yeah. Now, this is actually reflecting just the face on image. So you can imagine that for many clinicians, that's the data, the information they can use to help try them to diagnose whether this is a condition A, B or C. And you will hopefully uh, agree with me that it is a hard task because it looks um, sort of, there are some uniformity here, there's some veins, but there are some tiny features which trained experts will look for. Now, when we look this layer sideways, so the retina, when you look sideways, underneath that red image, there are lots of different layers of cells which drive the activity. That is actually what drives the vision for your brain. But that is built by different types of cells. So some of them are neurons, so they are connected to your brain. Other are specialized cells, which are also neurons, which sense the light and then send the image signal to your brain. But also other cells which are that support those uh, neurons, which are trying to sense the light. And this layer with so many different cells packed in is surprisingly thin. It just that thickness of two strands of hair. No, in a cross section. That's it. It's very thin. Now, when we think about the way that this can be diagnosed, when you look further down, straight on, it is hard because you're not seeing all the different layers of the cells. What if you could look it sideways? Luckily for the um, ophthalmology community, you can do it now with another kind of scanner, which is called the opto coherence tomographer, right? So the OCTs can now take that front on image, 
turn it sideways and look at these many layers of cells and it can image it. Uh, so the f so I, I always like to make an analogy as a, as, a, as a cake. So from these photos, we'll look top down onto the cake. So you'll see happy birthday written on it. Um, but then the OCT would allow you to see how the different layers look like. All right. Now, if you're thinking about those different multiple layers, we are now giving, we are now expanding the number of different features that can be used to, to diagnose different conditions. Yep. Um, so in 2016, there was a very interesting collaboration done by the Morfield Eye Hospital, uh, which worked with an AI company called DeepMind to try to bring in about uh, 1 million OCT scans images of slices um, to try to train algorithms, therefore little models, capable of automating diagnosis of diseases, which include AMD and diabetic retinopathy. So here's what they've done. Let me see. Um, so a OCT image actually are cross sections. Think about the onion that I showed you in my hamburger recipe example. If I gave you slices of onion, you can actually put the onion back together by putting the slice in the right place. You can reconstitute the slices into a 3D volume. That's what the OCT can allow the scientists to do. So all the, you have your eye, you have slices of images, which then are put together slice by slice and it constitutes the retina volume at the back of your eye. But more interestingly, each layer can then now be separated and each layer will now have new information that the scientist can use as features to train the algorithms. Again, with my example of cats, what defines a cat? We know how a cat looks like, right? Bright eyes, pointy ears, whiskers, certain type of fur, four paws, a tail. So each one of those features could be interpreted as a dimension or a feature or an element that can be added to compound the image or the model of a cat, right? If I brought you a Labrador, it clearly is not a cat because of the size, because of the shape of the snout, because of the shape of the ears. So these different parameters are, is what allows different, um, more precise diagnosis to be made. So instead of looking just top down, with the OCT scanner, you really increase the number of features that you can bring together. And this is what the AI algorithm that was trained to do uh, enabled. So instead of just looking top down, it was looking at so many different layers and comparing what are the features that exist in every single layer and actually mapping changes in those features that appear in different layers and combining that as a score. So what happens now is that because Piers Keen, my friend Piers Keen at Morfield, who led the study, brought all those scans and in each scan, they also said, this is the scan of a person with AMD. This is the scan of a person with diabetic retinopathy. This is the scan of a person with macular hole and so on and so forth. They were able to train a computer program who which then try to extract the features and learn what is the probability of a new scan that comes in that the system has never seen before. So the algorithm could take a new scan and then compare to the reference scans, it's one million that I trained the algorithms on. And then by looking at different layers, giving a different score to the probability of different diseases very, very excitingly, the resulting algorithm could diagnose more than 30 different conditions and as accurately as experienced optometrists and ophthalmologists. So basically here, there's a, it is a scientific graph, but this basically just shows you what is the rate of success. The better the, the, the prediction rate, the further up and to the left, you will find the prediction score. 
So all the circles are the prediction scores done by both optometrist or ophthalmologist. Those are include early career and also expert ones. And you can see that the machine actually outperforms them every single time. And this is great because if you can bring the expertise and the knowledge of the best consultant ophthalmologist, this means that as a program, as an algorithm, you can now copy this to the machine of those scanners. In one word, instead of the optometrist or ophthalmologist operating the machine who has never seen a certain diagnosis before, and if they're not so sure, instead of picking up the phone and asking their colleagues, the system has already learned that and can help the optometrist, optometrist or the ophthalmologist make decisions with higher rate of confidence. And this is actually so exciting that it was uh, uh, made cover of the prestigious scientific journal Nature Medicine. Pierce Keen is here, uh, standing with, with, with his uh, little suit here, and giving the Royal Institution's Christmas lecture together with Hannah Fry, really showcasing uh, how an OCT machine looks like and how AI algorithms can actually be used for that. But not only this, with sufficient data, it has been shown that other groups managed to use simple fundus photos, just the back of the eye, but if they knew that for each one of these pictures, we had information about the person to who this picture belongs to. For instance, the age, the blood pressure, whether they're diabetic or not, etc. Then you can also train AI algorithms to try to learn and extract ways to predict those features. So again, 2018 was a basket year. The same year, a research group within Google Health trained in algorithms using these fundus photos and clinical measurements from 280,000 people. These are all anonymized, okay? They know their blood pressure, etc., but they don't know who they are. So this is really safe. So they actually could predict several cardiovascular risks from a single fundus photos. So after training, they just injected new, completely new uh, image. And the system manages to not only tell age. So for instance, in this test case, which was not included in the training, so this completely new case, they fed it to the algorithm. And then the algorithm could tell the researchers that actually the algorithm, the system, actually the computer, sorry, predicted this to be 59 years old from someone 59 years old. And the actual age is 57.6 years old. The system predicted it, this is the scan of a lady, a female. And actually, it is a female. The system predicted this is a known smoker. And in fact, the person from which this image was extracted was a known smoker. It predicted that this person would be non-diabetic because of a parameter. And then in fact, it is non-diabetic. But also impressively, it could predict the BMI. So it predicted 24.1. Um, kilograms by, by, by per, per, per mass and per meter, sorry, and then the actual is 26.3, but also blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, all very close. So you can see the potential here. If we can bring enough data and tell the computer, these are the training set, this is a cat, this is somebody with diabetes, etc., we can start to bring and have machine learning algorithms that can help us detect those conditions. So this is all very good, and I'll just skip this one. And in fact, the data has been made available um, to train algorithms, and UK actually has the world's largest ophthalmic bar resource, which is called the Insight Hub. It's a project funded by the UK government, which actually involves University Hospital Birmingham, ourselves, Morfield's Eye Hospital, but some other uh, well-known players. Now, despite Google and Roche being included in this group, developing this platform, I want to tell you that they are here as technology um, partners, but they never get access to data. They have never got access to data. In fact, 
the access to data is only done if a project is approved by a fully um, independent group board of lay people and an expert who will decide whether this application can actually look and use the data, but only anonymized data. All the data that exists in the insight that is made available for research, you cannot figure out who that data is from. Yeah. So this is really exciting. We have the largest of such collection in the world. Now, there's a big gap because a big part of the challenge is that these algorithms were trained on data from people already with the condition, which is dropped into a hospital. And remember, we were tasked to try to figure out how we can help stop progression of AMD and even better, prevent it altogether. But then, if the data that we have is what we call enriched or skewed data, based only on late stage, we are now really missing how the disease looks like before we got to hospital. So in order for all these algorithms, because I've shown you two that have been developed, why have they not been yet released on the high street to help optometrists make decisions? It's because we need to test that algorithm with real world data from the community level which would include unclear and hard to define corner cases. In my example of cat, 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 that is very simple, that's very clear, it's a cat. But what if it's a, uh, a lion? What if it's a cheetah? What if it's one of those Egyptian cats without fur? Would the algorithm be sufficient to detect those? So in the, in the terms of disease algorithms, would they be sufficient to detect that nuances in the real world data from the community? We don't know. So besides challenging the research, we also need to get hold of this community level data so we can start training future iteration of those algorithms to deal with the diversity of cases they have not seen. The diversity which can also include ethnic diversity, age, geographic uh, diversity because depending on where you live in the city or in the rural areas you might have different risk uh, exposure different risks of diseases so just as we have the venerable colleagues who we call for advice ai algorithms are not infallible and that is predicated on how much cases much data were available for training and how each protocol is developed so the the gap so the other than helping algorithms, sorry, better discern disease from non-disease, there's also an, uh, an unprecedented opportunity here is that community level data might contain subtle signals and features that can help researchers to go after detection of diseases before they are severe or late sufficient to cause harm. So a final gap that community data can help address is what some of our colleagues are calling a data poverty whereby, just a mention, where certain segments of our population are not being represented at all uh, in those data sets. Which means that the algorithm that is being developed, being trained, might only work for some of us, whilst completely missing the mark for the others. So we need to ensure that the data being used to train AI algorithms are truly fair and representative. Now, despite the large volumes of clinical and hospital data, we the unleashing of AI algorithms depend on community level data. In other words, ranging from those ranging from people who are truly healthy to those who were just below the referral threshold or at a sub clinical state. Yeah? So different from most patients who are keen to have that data shared and looked by experts and researchers for a solution. Those below the referral threshold, those who are f which might, might look healthy, might not see a clear reason why their data should be made available for research. And here's where we argue that charities can work alongside optometrists and ophthalmologists to promote not only more regular exams to catch those unmistakable cases, but also avoid further harm. But more importantly, that their own retinal photos and scans are made available for researchers earlier on, so we can start working on a solution. So that if and when a disease catches up, there is a solution waiting. 
right? Do not wait until you have a condition to start sharing that information. So, as I said, there's a large amount of data being collected on a daily basis. Every time you go to the optometrist, the data is being collected. And a lot of this primarily on your high street optician, some on your uh, hospitals. And mostly when you are already being sent to hospital, you are having your late stage disease. And then a lot of things that we could be learning from early, healthy, and even asymptomatic, so before any symptom arises, it is still here, but we are not unfortunately capturing it because only hospitals are structured to bring this data together. Now, let me tell you what's exciting us, which is the Foresight Initiative, which is something we are going to be rolling out um, in the coming months this year. So we have been working on a new model to enable aggregation of retinal imaging uh, and scans only from consented participants at community level. We will also ask those participants to allow us to link not, not only us to be bringing the data together and make it a community level version of insight, but with pre-hospital data, but we will also be asking the participants for their consent for us to link with other health records. And of course, everything we'll be doing for any access in the future will be done always at an, as anonymized data sets. But if you allow us, the public, the patients, allow us to get the data and link with hospital records, only truly gold standard initiatives such as the NHS Digital, which preserves the privacy at its utmost uh, uh, um, priority, so they really take that very seriously, but also very large initiatives, which are the global reference such as the UK Biobank and the new one, which is being um, promoted, funded by the UK government called Our Future Health. What Our Future Health is doing is collecting blood from different participants across the UK and they're aiming at gathering blood, of course, from consenting participants uh, of 5 million Britons. That is 10% of the adult population in the UK, four nations. So they can also try to study how the healthy Britain looks like. What is the genetics that defines uh, a healthy Britain and what the genetics can tell them about risk factors. Because if you think about this, if you have eye scans, your medical records and the genetics, and again, all in an anonymized form for research, we can start defining whether certain people with higher risk because of inheritance are really going down the path of that uh, disease manifesting because it is not only genetics, isn't it? It's always genetics plus the environment. A good example, a good analogy is to say that even if you bought the most well-built Rolls Royce built in the UK and you baby the car forever, it will probably not break. But if you took that thing and just try to drive the jungles of Bornell, yeah, it will break, right? So this is the example of genetics, where it was born, the car was manufactured under the same kind of uh, process. That's, it comes, it's born this way, but depending how the environment is exposed, you will have higher or lower rate of failure, right? So this is what we want to do. We want to get eye scans and your consent, the public's consent, the participants' consent to link those with certain features that we can help annotate and help the UK to actually finally moving from always and actually globally firefighting disease into can we catch the disease earlier, can we intercept it earlier and then treat even before it really causes any harm. So final word is that with so much pressure on the NHS, especially in secondary care where ophthalmology has been the busiest outpatient specialty for several consecutive years, it is now not only logical, but necessary to better call upon primary care. 
and AI has potential to increase even more, say, the correct referral rate, but it's dependent on community level real world data to be collectively made available for research and validation. It is with this critical piece that we, the public patients, optometrists, ophthalmologists and charities should be collaborating to quickly assemble, explore and deploy. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank your attention and I'll give the word back to Cathy for Q&A. Thank you very much, Lee. That's, um, that's a terrific um, explanation of it. Um, if you have any questions, do pop them in the chat function and we'll get to as many as we can. So, Lee, I, 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 I talked about how this is going to help us um, develop early, um, better trials for early stage um, disease. So. There are several things happening here at once, aren't there? Just, just help me with um, uh, how, what I meant by that. <laughs> what do I mean by helping us design better clinical trials for early stage disease? Absolutely. That's a great question, Cathy. Thank you so much. So what happens uh, with AMD especially, it is a long, long um, disease that develops during a long time. Even if we can find, and we have some uh, interesting results, which we'll be hoping to share uh, in a future talk, even if we can find a drug or a medicine that can hopefully prevent or delay the onset of AMD, think about how the clinical trial will look like. You have early signs. Here, take this pill, but take this pill for 10 to 15 years before, and this is where perhaps AMD would take to develop from early stage to the end when you start losing your sight. It is then by the end of year 10 or 15 that we can really make be sure whether that treatment worked or not. That's not possible. We cannot design a trial that way. But because we only are focused so much on the end stage, right? The sight loss. How do we, we, only measure, we only measure it by sight loss, don't we? Exactly. Right? What are the features that we can use to say, if you have these initial early symptoms, you will definitely have the disease. So instead of tracking for 10, 15 years, you look at eye scans and say, if you have these features occurring, high risk, take the pill. Let's see whether in three years we stop the speed of that progression. So it's finding those earlier signs that everybody can agree, yes, this is a sign of disease progression, or this is a sign that this therapeutic agent, whatever it is, is working. And we can get that agreement much earlier before people start to lose their sight. That would be a fantastic thing, wouldn't it? So let's crack on with the questions now, because we've got lots and lots coming in here. So the first one, a very early one, and this is something to weigh off very quickly. And this is about trust, isn't it? Yes. You know, people are concerned about handing over their health data and who knows where it will go. Who will use this for the wrong reasons? Um, how do they know that this isn't going to come back to bite them later? Um, down the line when somebody um, uses these, this, this data for um, nefarious reasons or for reasons that people didn't originally um, envisage or intend. It's the trust question, isn't it? Yes. So very good question. And there are two things we have to, to, to kind of dissociate here. One, the question here, how can we trust AI on this? If by AI you mean the method, the algorithm that's been helping us to diagnose, etc., then of course, properly done science with regulators at the end of the approval stage will be poking all the possible holes that they can to try to figure out whether it's safe, representative, and can be deployed. That's the same process as any drug registration where a manufacturer comes to the drug, say it does this, but the regulators are looking very carefully to see whether there are any side effects, things that have missed. So it is the same process. Now, when you talk about trust on who is using the data, that's a different game, a different matter. And in this sense, that's why we as a charity, which we won't have any financial incentive, we don't want to be rich, right? We just want to deliver the best outcome for the patient. Charities are really the only unconfounded stakeholder to be able to ensure that we will be the gatekeepers to whoever asks to use. And if they ask to use the data, they have to show us the evidence that they are trustworthy and we put that in the contract if they fail we can go after them right and castigate that malpractice so i guess the the other thing is um around the trust is this is the privacy as, aspect isn't it whether this is anonymized data 
whether somebody will be able to track that back to me. And then, of course, we all know that people get hacked. So it's just, yeah, hacked like that. So it, it is a concern, isn't it? Um, and um, and I, I suppose we what we want to do is reassure people that there are enough checks and balances in place. Uh, Correct. In charity, we are we are there with good intent. Um, but it, it is a concern, and, and particularly you, you referred to this data poverty, this idea that certain groups of people are perhaps more suspicious or less willing to share their data or less able to have fewer opportunities to share their data. But of course, that means that information about that particular group will be lacking in the mix uh, and the results will be less good for that, those people um, than, than other groups. There's a, a, a question here about are high street opti opticians now asking people to take part in eye, eye scans. And of course, that's the next stage that we're moving to, isn't it? Indeed. Thank you so much. That's a great question. We are working very hard, uh, hard to actually get the optometrists to participate in this because we cannot do it alone. We need to have a large number of those scans so we do have sufficient data to train those algorithms. Um, we are in discussion with them. We are going to be uh, asking for those who would like to join this effort to list their practice. And once we roll the project out, we will make that list available on the participating optometrist who will be working with us and helping us collect the data. And the important thing is that to collect data according to an agreed algorithm, sorry, protocol. So we're not doing you know, different things, right? So everybody agree on how to collect then the data that comes in to the repository is cleaner and more ready for research. So and a question here is about how would this be funded? How would the AI be funded? Would patients um, be interested to, um, who are interested in taking part be asked to contribute to the costs of this project? For, so from, from the AAAMD Foresight Initiative project, the answer to that is no, isn't it? Exactly right. So the answer is a no, a resounding no. Because if we ask people to contribute, we will start to create, you know, uh, uh, by accident, a divide. Those who can pay, it, those who cannot. So at the point of joining, it will be free to everybody. Um, from the funding of the initiative, we are also, and I want to make it very clear, staying away from uh, money-making initiatives. So for foresight, we're just seeking funding structures that comes from philanthropic funding or groups that don't say, oh, I'm giving you the money. I have to say on who can get access to data. We are removing that completely. And again, that's only a charity we can do because any commercial uh, organization or entity initiative will go down inevitably down that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a, a few questions just point out to um, people on the call today. Lee is not an, an ophthalmologist. He's not a clinician. So he's not really in a position to answer questions about, about treatments and, and, and the benefits of turmeric and, and, and things like that. So I'm sorry, that's probably not going to be very helpful on this particular uh, next month, may, maybe, but possibly on not on this particular particular one. So, but, but this is a useful question because it ties into the Our Future Health Initiative. Should everyone who is diagnosed with AMD have a general health check, um, a blood pressure, cholesterol, or, or so on. And of course, what's really important is that people, if possible, sign up to both the eye scans when they get rolled out and also the Our Future Health so that we join up those two sets of data. And of course, by joining Our Future Health, you get the free health check, don't you? That's the whole point. Yes, you do. And thank you, Kathy. Thank you for, for, for the participant who asked the question. This is so important because UK, with these efforts and us, taking this special interest in eye health, we are perhaps one of the first countries to move the entire firefighting mode into the understanding how the disease occur and try to stop it earlier on. And we do have such unique, I mean, I, can, I have goosebumps every time I talk about it. My American colleagues keep telling, you guys have an amazing system here in the UK because with the NHS records, with this public funded initiative, which are looking at genetics and hours into eye scans and many other that will come up, we will be the envy of the world. And uh, if you allow me, Kathy, when we talk about all of these things in the press, how NHS doesn't have more money, it has to be more efficient. Think about this. If we can help the optometrist to send only those people who need to hospital, 
we already increased the productivity of NHS without a single pound being injected into the system. Because at this stage, because of the uncertainties of diagnosis, we know that, for instance, at the Morfield's Eye Hospital, out of 7,000 people which are, were referred in 2016 as, please, ophthalmologists, look at this, it's urgent, wet AMD. Out of those 7,000 cases, only 800 were real. So all the rest, they didn't need to go to hospital. What does that mean? That means that people needed to be seen within two weeks. But because of all the unneeded visits, people were waiting for eight weeks. So, of course, there were people losing sight because of that. Now, if we can help through data, better diagnosis, better referral, we can immediately help NHS improve in perhaps a shorter time frame. So at the moment, um, this scheme isn't, because people are asking, how, how, do they, how do they get involved in this? So at the moment, this is not yet operational, is it? But so at the moment, if you go to your high street optometrist and ask for an eye scan, then you will have to pay for it. Um, uh, it will be through this scheme that you would get the free eye scan, um, uh, but that's not quite running yet. But that, that is the intention, that people would go to their participating optometrist and say, um, I, I want to give my data to this, to this, um, this project, my eye scan data to this project. Um, uh, and, and then we would also ask them to go and have um, the full um, uh, uh, health check through the Our Future Health plan. So Lee, when do you think this might be running? We're talking about, we're certainly talking this year, aren't we? Are we talking about first half of this year? Do you think we'll be doing it soon? Thank you. I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to think about this on the early second half of this year, right? Think about um, um, beginning of, uh, end of spring, beginning of summer, yeah, around that stage. Uh, and I'm really, it really touched my heart to see there's so many people saying, we'd like to volunteer, we'd like to help. Holding there, we're nearly there. We just need to make sure that because it's a large project and we are aiming at getting at least half a million participants, that this all needs to be super, super ethically approved, designed, because it's for the entire generation of Britons. It's for our future. We are designing in a way that we are going to do it right the first time. We don't want to be back paddling. So we are right, doing the right contract. We are also discussing with optometrists. I saw a question about the cost. We will be, we will be indeed creating, recompensing the, uh, the optometrists for their help. But of course, as a charity, and the way that the, the economic situation is, we cannot definitely afford a high street price, right? But if we all agree that everybody have a part to play in it, I'm sure the optometrists, you know, we, un we understand a few of them are already very, they really like the, the idea and uh, bigger vision they are in already. So hopefully we can all together bring this new vision quickly. Because the more people participating we have, the more optometrists participating we have, the quicker we can get the information into the hands of experts and help us bring the innovation that we all need. That's, um, that's great. And of course, the, you, you made the point um, in a conversation we were having the other day that, of course, we today are benefiting from the data that other people have shared in the past, don't we? We're, we're, we are beneficiaries today. Um, and, and there's a duty, perhaps, on us to do that. There's a question here. Um, I have a feeling that the data should be randomised rather than being collected from macular society folk. That would be a bias. And of course, yes, it's not just macular society folk, is it? We want we want five hundred thousand people from the population. We want your your children and your grandchildren to sign up to this as well, don't we? Yes. Absolutely. And it's a great question. And I think I see a question just just zoom past me uh, that the 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 um, our our friend says that uh, I have genetics too and don't like the A in MD. Thank you, Caroline, that's great pitch. So this is the idea. We're not talking about just people um, at the end stage. We are definitely trying to figure out ways we can help them too. But more importantly, those with family members, friends who are aware of the condition, the best way to help this not happen to any of our loved ones or friends, etc., is to really encourage more and more people to join this effort, right? So, and I'm even in a semi-selfish way, the way the speed that the research evolves, 
we might even see a treatment in our lifetime. So my dad, he passed away, but he had early AMD. Luckily, he didn't lose his sight. But I am starting to, to, to be aware that if I go down that route and live longer than him, I might lose my sight. So I am already doing, hopefully, my part in trying to figure out something for all of us today, now. But more importantly, as Kathy mentioned, together with our Future Health Initiative, and also by sharing the medical records, we might be even using the eye scans to track way more than just macular conditions, cardiovascular. Um, there are some studies, exciting studies, which I skipped, sorry, that are trying to look to use eye scans to detect early signs of Alzheimer's, for instance, right? So it is really a brave new world. And, and that, that is because the retina is really part of the brain, isn't it? These are brain cells that we can see through, through, the, um, through the pupil. We can get access. Yeah. We can look at neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or MS or Parkinson's. All of these may, in fact, be uh, revealed in really um, high, high quality analysis of these eye scans. It really is an amazing future. Just one more question before we close, which is uh, just again about the, the security. When can we, somebody asked, when can we see uh, Intel information about the guarantees about security of these data? Big Pharma across the world view the UK NHS data as a rich, inverted commas, rich source of health intelligence. And, and of course it is. So will you be publishing the 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 the, the security systems, the, the, the ethic, ethics, um, um, boundaries and so on, and how exactly this will work. Will that be publicly available? Absolutely, absolutely. So we will be showing, that's interesting thing about the UK ecosystems, that there are some ethics and uh, approved by the Health Research Authority and so on and so forth. We will be requiring the highest level of scrutiny by any participant. We will be checking whether they are who they say. We also will be looking at what are the terms they say they're going to use the data for and bring that, as I said, in the contract of using, of accessing the data. We will never send a copy of data elsewhere. No, no, no. Anyone who would like to use the data, be the British scientist, the Scottish science, well, they are in the UK, sorry, uh, but also perhaps our colleagues in Germany or our colleagues in the US, they will have to bring their algorithms to Triple MD or the four sites on cloud. So it can only do research on approved systems, right? So that is to be ensured. And we will be, as Cathy said, publishing a lot of the criteria. You can have a look already. Um, insight in one way was sort of a training wheel for us. And we were engaged there because we were designing an ethical access where the public and patient have a say and do have a proper role as the gatekeepers of who uses that. And I happen to work with the group that developed that protocol. So you can look into Insight under the keyword data tab, right? So the Data Trust Advisory Board. So we all provide that kind of scrutiny before anything is released. That's wonderful. And um, we've run out of time, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so sorry. I, we could have gone on for a lot longer uh, on, on this, I'm sure. Um, but we'll have Lee back again later in the year when we get to the next stage of this. I'm sorry that we weren't able to answer some of the more detailed questions about people's specific circumstances. But if you do have questions about your condition or you want some uh, information about dietary advice and supplements and so on, please call our advice line first thing in the morning. They're open at nine o'clock. And the number is 0300 30 30 111. The number is on our website. That's 0300 30 30 111. We will keep everybody up to date on how this, pro, um, this um, project progresses. Um, if you're a member, you will get our Side View magazine. Side View is a great, great magazine, and membership is uh, an absolute steal at £22 pounds a year. And details on our website. Um, or you can sign up for our email newsletter. Again, details on the website, um, and you'll get really up to date information about how this program progresses. Um, Lee, thank you again for joining us this evening. Um, thank you to everybody who has been online with us uh, tonight. Next month, next um, month, our guest is consultant ophthalmologist Martin McKibben, who will join us to explain what he has found out 
recently about the quality and the variability of care for AMD patients in the NHS. Martin has led the work to audit how well the NHS provides AMD care. And the first report is just about to be published. So he'll be telling us what the report says and how patients can find out what their local NHS service um, uh, is providing and how it compares to others around the country. So that's next month, Tuesday, the 21st of February, Shrove Tuesday at uh, 7 p.m. We've recorded tonight's show, so if you want to see it again, it'll be online in a few days' time. Uh, and if you think there's anybody else who might be interested in it, please tell them where to find it on our website. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for joining us this evening. Have a very good evening till next month. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.